Two Foreskins Walk Into a Bar, a serial novel by Chris Thompson, narrated by Chris Thompson. Chapter 3, Man Fucks Dog. Lionel was affronted on Robert's behalf by what I'd written in the letter and chided me at length. It was the passage where I directed Robert to take everything he'd learnt about intimacy and relationships from me and use it in his next relationship that particularly aggravated Lionel. Everything you taught him, you mean? No, you taught him to love, that's what you're implying. Have you any idea how patronising and arrogant that is? Lionel's sentences were punctuated by bursts of the vacuum cleaner. He was having gastrointestinal issues and as a result was producing rather mephitic farts. Not wanting to disrupt the flow of conversation, he would pass wind and then try and suck up the stench with the vacuum nozzle. We were in his room in downtown Brooklyn. Lionel had slimmed down his possessions to one suitcase and a pile of books. He could always be ready to leave at a moment's notice. The last four years of his life were characterised by itinerancy and disruption. For someone who could see things so clearly and with so much critical acuity, it surprised me that he'd lived through so much chaos. When we first met in the library, he told me that his motivation for sobriety came to him at a chemsex party where he overheard two men talking. One of them was a veterinarian and was arranging with the other guy to come to his clinic and have sex with a dog. So horrified was Lionel that his drug use had brought him into contact with such miscreants, he vowed never to touch drugs or booze again. But by then he was homeless and sleeping rough in various places around the city. Over time, he'd got himself into a shelter and then temporary accommodation where we now found ourselves reading Anna Karenina out loud, reproaching my audacity with my ex and sucking up his farts with a hoover. You could smell other residents smoking crack through the air vents. When he thought I was asleep or in the bathroom, Lionel would stand up on a chair, put his head against the vent and breathe in deep and slow. Not a night went by where he wasn't woken up by a neighbour needing paraphernalia or offering him head in exchange for drugs. But Lionel was resolute, and I loved him even more for it. I took the Staten Island ferry with Laura on a round trip. We were sat on deck facing out to the water. A bird flew parallel with us, and for a moment as the sun set, the colour of the sky matched the colour of the boat. I told Laura that I'd fallen in love with Lionel. You haven't fallen in love with him, you just think you have. Isn't it the perfect way to protect yourself from the pain of losing Robert? This was an outrageous allegation. I've done my grieving, I whimpered. And didn't he tell you not to fall in love with him? Yes, but he's not experienced my kind of love before. Laura brought her hands to her face, I presume, to stop it moving so obviously as she rolled her eyes. We sat in silence for a time, then sang Let the River Run from Working Girl, which was the purpose of the trip. I couldn't sing full out. I felt wounded from having been penetrated so cleanly by Laura's Satori. There can be this thing that you know is true. Let's call it P. P is true. But it's possible to convince yourself of not P. People do it all the time. A father who can't see his wife is abusing their son. A mother who can't see their child is a criminal. It is entirely possible to look at something in your life and say, this is not what this is. And some people are masters of it. I read in a book, I can't remember which one now, that we can only know what we can bear to know. When I was in Chicago, I saw an art installation. In the middle of the room were three screens showing three films that take place in a former Benedictine monastery outside Kassel, Germany. The artist plays with the history of the country's role in World War II by imagining these fictional tales in different times of the monastery's past. One screen shows the camp being liberated by American troops in 1945. Another shows the building being used by radicals caught up in the social upheavals of the late 1960s. And the third portrays a high school field trip to the site in the 1990s. The same actors appear in each scenario playing different roles. As I walked through it, I realised I could only watch one single film or walk amongst the screens, but there was no way to see all three films at once. I'd been dreaming of this art installation. But in my dreams, the films were of men, but not men I knew or would ever meet. I told Laura about the installation and my corresponding dream, hoping she'd see it as the rebuttal I intended. The gull, who had drifted along with us, had disappeared, and the Statue of Liberty looked small and fragile. What's your point? My point is, I've done my grieving, and I think Lionel deserves to know how I feel. 
Laura and I kissed goodbye on both cheeks, as was our wont, and I sat down in the corner of Julia's bar to catch up with some admin. At that time, for me, admin meant woofing tops on scruff. I'd been working on a joke that brought together woofing tops and the whiffing poofs. I'd been trying it out with various friends and hookups, but I couldn't land it. I was reformulating the joke when I stumbled across a profile that took my breath away. I'm looking for someone friendly, flirty, witty, and willing. Someone who isn't afraid to be himself and nerd out. Someone who isn't afraid to be a good daddy's boy. Talk to me about classical music, biotech, your goals and intentions and desires and hopes, your yearning to be guarded by daddy and to be daddy's little stud. I raced to the bathrooms and masturbated. I read and reread those words, each time feeling tingles down the back of my neck as if he himself were in the room caressing me. The promise of safety, the invitation to be vulnerable, I wrote to him immediately a long, heartfelt missive responding to each of his points in detail. Rather than take his items in the order he gave them, I wanted to show my creativity. I took them from last to first, ending with my love of Jesse Norman's rendition of Mon cœur s'ouvre à ta voix as my satisfaction for his first criteria. To ensure my application stood out, I attached a video of me fingering my anus in a jockstrap with the caption Mon trou s'ouvre à ta voix. So pumped with adrenaline was I by mere language, I ordered myself another drink and did some breathing exercises. His name was Mike. I went to visit my Playtex at the drama bookshop. On my first visit, they had in stock six copies each of Carthage and Albion. Whenever I felt my career was dying on its ass, which was often, I'd visit my Playtex and remind myself I was still a viable concern. I stood and stroked them, checking my phone intermittently to see if Mike had replied. These Playtex represented an hourglass or a countdown clock. Over time, there were fewer and fewer remaining. I was certain they hadn't been purchased, merely taken out to make way for other writers. I told myself, when there were no Playtex left, my career is over, like the final petal to fall from the rose in Beauty and the Beast. When my plays were gone, so was I. I went to look at my nemesis plays. She had a total of 17 plays in stock. They looked shit, but I nodded respectfully. Today she felt like a worthy opponent, and I made a private vow to take her down. My phone beeped. My daddy wants to guard me and let me be his little stud. He's picked me. It was, in fact, Harvey. Let's call him that. I didn't expect to hear from you, he said. Harvey, when you were in my apartment, do you remember seeing a letter on the desk by the window? Oh, your letter to Robert. Yes. I threw it away. Why the fuck did you do that? You're still in love with him. Look, I've been where you've been. I had a really wonderful thing with a good and honorable man and I threw it all away because I had some dumb midlife crisis. You should be with him. My mouth was wide open. By the way, full disclosure, I read it. That bit where you say you taught him how to love and that he should use everything he's learned from being with you in his next relationship. That was so beautiful. But that's you. You're his next relationship. Silence. Oh, and also, you're not a bad writer, but I have some notes. I hung up. I was scandalized. That treacherous little bitch, I repeated out loud as I marched out the bar into the New York night. I resolved to waste no more time and tell Lionel I loved him. I rehearsed my speech. We make each other laugh. The sex is amazing. I feel a lot of joy. I feel totally connected to you. We can be playful or serious, and you make me happy. When I'm not with you, I miss you. I restructured it on the subway, bringing the joy further up, placing the missing you part in the middle so it ends more positively with happy. That felt better. I typed it into the notes app on my phone and committed it to memory. I passed a bookshop with a quotation emblazoned on its window. I am deliberate. I am afraid of nothing. I saw myself in the reflection of the glass, emerging from the darkness and mingling with the words like Pepper's ghost. Yes, I said, yes. The elevator was taking an age, so I bounded two steps at a time. I ran down his hallway and knocked on Lionel's door, sweating and breathless, my declaration now off book on the tip of my tongue. But there was no answer. His neighbour poked her head round her front door. Are you looking for Lionel? Yes. Have you seen him? Oh, honey, 
He moved out this morning. Next time on Two Foreskins Walk Into a Bar. Get in, you crazy bitch, Silvio barked. In one hand, he had the steering wheel. In the other, his hard, enormous cock. Thanks for listening. If you're enjoying, please rate and review wherever you get your podcasts.